Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. In talking about American slavery, it's usually, if not always, about the southern portions of the United States. Rarely, if ever, do we talk about California. Now, it's true that the state legally banned slavery almost at the very beginning, but one could make a strong argument that when it came to California's indigenous populations in the middle of the 19th century, and before that with the Spanish and Mexican rule, California slavery had slavery by any other name. Indentured servitude would be one such name. Many indigenous people throughout the state were literally tied to a master who would be hunted and returned if they escaped. Men and women alike worked in the fields and homes of large land owners, land usually taken from indigenous people themselves. But California's indigenous people, who also faced what Benjamin Madley called an American genocide, resisted these conditions and preserved their culture and stories, and today are an important player in California political life. Today we're going to be in conversation about how California Indians responded, resisted, and adopt, adapted to Spanish, Mexican, and American conquest and rule. William Bauer is my guest. William Bauer is a professor of history at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he is the director of American Indian and Indigenous Studies. He is also a citizen of the Round Valley Reservation in Northern California. He is the co-author of the book that we are going to be in conversation about. It's called We Are the Land, A History of Native California. Previously, he also wrote such books as California Through Native Eyes, Reclaiming History, and We Were All Like Migrant Workers Here, Work, Community, and Memory on California's Round Valley Reservation, 1850 to 1941. William Bauer joins me via Zoom. William Bauer, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Thanks, Mitch, for having me. I, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. As am I. Talk to me about what we know about California Indians before European colonization? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times, I think the, the way in which we kind of get that knowledge, I think we're kind of how we understand and know about kind of California Indian history before the arrival of Europeans has often been through the frameworks of, say, archaeology and, and anthropology. Uh, you know, this kind of this, the way in which kind of people kind of would go up to archaeological sites and dig around and, and find things and, and kind of interpret things based on that. Um, but I think one of the things that we try to do in this book is to really kind of understand kind of California history from a, an indigenous perspective. And so one of the ways in which we attempted to, to have us kind of understand kind of California Indian history before the arrival of Europeans is to rely on oral traditions and, and creation stories. And I, and I think one of the things that that, that does is that you know, kind of borrowing from a, another Cherokee scholar, uh, indigenous scholar kind of thinking about these issues is that we wanted to tell a history of California as a creation story, not necessarily a history of the way in which California was colonized by non, non-native non peoples. And so kind of we, we, uh, we, we kind of privilege and emphasize kind of these creation stories and oral traditions as a way to understand kind of California, how California Indians understand uh, the past, present, and future. And I think one of the things that that um, oral traditions and creation stories always emphasize in California uh, is indigenous people's kind of deep relationship with the land. Um, that relationship with the land begins at the moment in which indigenous peoples are created uh, in specific places throughout what, what we know as the state of California. And that relationship kind of carries on in, into the present day. Uh, and I think the other thing that, that or, uh, oral traditions and creation stories do is that they kind of tell us kind of the deep relationships between kind of indigenous peoples and the land. Uh, for instance, kind of talking about the ways in which indigenous peoples named certain kind of features in, in, uh, on the landscape, uh, but also kind of relationships with the things around them, such as acorns and, and salmon and that sort of thing. So, for instance, in Northern California, one of the we reasons that we know that acorns are so viable and, and important to kind of indigenous peoples before the arrival of Europeans uh, is that indigenous peoples had oral traditions and oral histories about the kind of the creation uh, of the uh, of, of acorns, the way in which acorn trees uh, were all named. Uh, so, I mean, I think one of the ways in which we really kind of try to get at the way in which how we or how we understand indigenous kind of this history bef before Europeans arrived is to think through and use oral traditions and, and think about relationships to the land, indigenous relationships to the land. And indigenous relationships to to other facets of, of California life, such as plants, rocks, animals, and that sort of thing. You write early on in the book, uh, "We we are the land," and this piqued my interest that there's something about these creation stories that that give title, that give indigenous people title to the land, as an argument as as this was 
and is perhaps their land. Yeah, I mean, I think that's where we were kind of going with with the title of the book, right? We are the land. That that notion that California Indians are the the kind of the land of California and have a deep abiding relationship with the land of California begins at creation. And I, and I think it's a it's a different way of kind of thinking about relationship with the land and, and rivers and and all all aspects of kind of California is that you know California Indian oral histories and oral traditions typically argue that indigenous peoples were born in one specific place in California. So that uh, the Yuki tribe of Northern California, which are located on the Round Valley Reservation where I grew up, uh, have a creation story. It, their creation story positions them as being created in Northern, in, in the Round Valley area. Uh, and then to the, the East, right? The Maidu people, uh, they have a creation story. Their creation story positions them at a specific place, typically kind of around the, kind of the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, and so they, so those two different tribal nations have very different creation stories. They have different relationships with land and place throughout the state of California. And, and I think that it, it does kind of speak to kind of a different system of, of kind of thinking about relationships to the land and even kind of, and as you kind of said, right, title or land ownership and possession of, of, of place. And this is not to say that indigenous peoples throughout North America, uh, you know, they have an understanding of owning owning the land and owning property and, and claiming territory are kind of the difference is, is not owning, say, private property or privately o- owning land. It's that, that land was kind of possessed communally by, by all the people. Do you think this should have any kind of, of legal standing? And, and it, does this counter sort of the, the European notion of the beginning of California? Well, I, I think tribes have, have long kind of fought to have or to kind of use our, or these oral traditions and these oral arguments, uh, these oral histories kind of to prove this kind of original, this Aboriginal title. I mean, this is kind of a long-standing kind of political context, legal context, right? In in, in North American history, not only kind of so, uh, focused, say, on California, uh, right? uh, the the doctrine of discovery, right? That that kind of fifteenth-century kind of set of kind of legal doctrines that were created uh, right after kind of Christopher Columbus gets lost in the Caribbean, kind of undermined and or made the argument that that indigenous peoples did not kind of own property, didn't have kind of what we would understand in kind of a capital sense, kind of title of uh, title title to the land. And so throughout kind of indigenous peoples have made the argument throughout that the way in which those kind of claim were homelands were always kind of articulated and created, articulated through through oral traditions and oral histories. So they become kind of the foundation for which kind of California Indian people and, and indigenous peoples across North America they find ways of kind of articulating their, their relationship to place and space. Indigenous economies pre-European colonization is, is pretty fascinating. T- tell me more about that. And, and were, they, were they integrated between different groups? Yeah, I think that there's been always this kind of view for a long time. There was this view that indigenous peoples across North America tended to be kind of isolated, living in small little communities, tucked away from everyone. Um, but I, I think, I mean, this is actually one kind of great kind of development that that archaeology has actually kind of helped us to understand is that they helped us understand that indigenous communities weren't isolated and remote. And actually kind of indigenous peoples were kind of connected to communities and, and peoples across the continent. And so that kind of in terms of trade, right, that, that there were trade trails that kind of interspersed and interlinked all indigenous peoples throughout what is now what we know as the state of California with indigenous peoples in the Great Basin, uh, in to, to the far kind of Pacific Northwest, uh, to the north of us, uh, to into kind of say what is now Baja California, uh, indigenous trade goods that were made um, on the Pacific coast in, in what is now Southern California could end up in Pueblo communities in, in what is now central New Mexico. Right. So we do. So I think one of the things kind of one of the kind of important aspects of this kind of pre Columbian or this kind of, yeah, this pre kind of European colonization economic practices was kind of this vital and rich trade network that stitched together indigenous communities across regions and across kind of, especially kind of on the Western part of this, uh, of this continent. Uh, and then on the other hand, as I kind of mentioned a little earlier, uh, indigenous peoples kind of relied on kind of hunting good, good uh, hunting kind of uh, animals, uh, and then harvesting a variety of plant life throughout California. So, right, if you look at Northern California, uh, right, acorns are kind of the staple kind of e- economic good that is both traded and consumed within communities. Uh, and it, unsurprisingly, right, it, it features so prominently in oral traditions. But, you know, if you go down to the Colorado River region of North America, of what is now California, you see indigenous peoples practicing kind of floodplain agriculture 
you know, it, it was a kind of a vital kind of rich kind of and diverse kind of economic region uh, before kind of the, before contact with, with Europeans. And, and, and I think we'll kind of get at this as we kind of carry on to this conversation is that that kind of diversity, these kind of economic practices by indigenous peoples will persist into the 20th and, and into the 21st century. So that, that was going to be my next question is, is did these economic systems survive post European settlement? Absolutely. And, and they, they kind of survive in kind of different and, and u- unique ways. Uh, indigenous peoples were kind of continued to, ch- they, they continued to trade with newcomers, right? When the Spanish first arrived on the shores of what is now California, indigenous peoples uh, would often come out to meet them. And actually, I, 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 it shouldn't even be shores. A lot of times the first encounters between indigenous peoples and the Spanish occurred out on the Pacific Ocean, that indigenous peoples would see these Spanish ships sailing up, Indigenous peoples would get into their own vessels, canoes, and, and, and that sort of thing, and row out and meet them and, and try to get on their ships and kind of engage them in trade and, and these other kind of activities. Uh, and so kind of trade was kind of a vital way in which Indigenous peoples first encountered uh, the Spanish and, and uh, English traders and, and a whole host of, of, of people in, in that kind of first encounter. And so kind of trade was kind of vital to that first encounter. Uh, the trade of foodstuffs, for instance, indigenous peoples would often kind of exchange the food that they had to, to Spanish sailors for material goods. Um, but indigenous peoples had a whole host of things that, that, that the Spanish kind of uh, desired, I guess, would be the kind of the, the, the important word there, right? So not only was it food, but it was knowledge and information. Um, indigenous peoples knew about other Spanish expeditions that were occurring in the interior of California, uh, interior of North America. And that information would kind of would be kind of passed <laughs> from from community to community, and the native peoples when they would when they would meet with the Spanish and they would say something like, "Oh, sure, we know about other people like you more in the interior of California." Um, and then it was indigenous knowledge, right? I mean, the Spanish didn't know how to sail along California's coast, but indigenous peoples did, and so often that they would, uh, you know, guide Spanish ships into safe harbors. They would tell the Spanish about what uh, you know how to kind of navigate the Pacific coast. A whole host of kind of trade goods, uh, information, knowledge, uh, indigenous peoples of, of California kind of traded and shared uh, with Spanish newcomers beginning in the 16th century and kind of continuing on uh, into the 17th, 18th and, and 19th centuries. I have one last question about oral histories, though, of course, and oral stories, though, of course, we can get back into them later if, if, it, if it's appropriate to. Um, but that is and, and this was fascinating. You have a previous book about this a New Deal program during the 1930s that sought these indigenous stories. And when we think of the New Deal in a program like this, oftentimes we think about another program that they had that was meant to find surviving former enslaved people to tell their oral histories about that. Um, I didn't realize until, in fact, what led me to your most recent book was uh, California Through Native Eyes. I also picked up that book during my short sabbatical and started reading through that, (laughs) was that there was a comparable uh, uh, program from the New Deal seeking to capture the stories from indigenous people in California. Yeah, there, there was. There's this. Uh, uh, during the 1930s, there was a public works project uh, that would that was in located in Mendocino County, and in the Owens Valley of, of California, right? And it was uh, intended to kind of collect ethnographic information. Uh, and it was started by uh, the anthropologist Alfred Kroeber at the University of, of, of California, or now the University of California, Berkeley. And and as you note, I mean, it was very similar uh, to the Works Progress Administration of the WPA project. That occurred in the 1930s, and that in the WPA project in the South, especially, uh, was intended to uh, interview African Americans who experienced slavery and/or Reconstruction uh, in the ni- uh, in, in the ni- 19th century. The project that happened in California, though, was a little bit different, uh, and I think the, the key difference here is that in the California project, Native people interviewed other Native people. Uh, this was this was one of the this was kind of developed at the founding of the project. So Alfred Kroeber, when um, he applied to the state to create this kind of this this he wanted kind of a much larger kind of ethnographic or kind of oral history collection or oral history project in, in the 1930s. Um, he said he wrote it in his grant proposal is that he wanted Native people to interview other Native people uh, in in part right because it's the Great Depression Native Native people were kind of suffering from kind of high rates of unemployment because of the of the Great Depression so he wanted to kind of inject help inject um, at least some kind of wages into Native communities and so he wanted to kind of do this project throughout the state 
it, but it kind of was kind of uh, reduced to just be Mendocino County and in the Owens Valley of California. It's key, I think, that Native people were interviewing other Native people uh, because it allows Native peoples to kind of control the production of knowledge. Right. So my great grandfather was interviewed uh, for this state public works project, um, and he was interviewed by my great aunt. And so that's what you often see in these interviews is either family members interviewing one another or friends and families kind of interviewing one another. And it allows Native peoples to kind of control the production of knowledge. And that's one of the kind of the criticisms of the WPA slave narrative projects that, that we had just mentioned. I mean, that's a, the WPA slave narratives were vitally important to kind of re, uh, re kind of interpreting how we understood uh, the uh, right, slavery and, and reconstruction. But often what would happen in that project is that white public employees would be interviewing elderly African-American people, right? So there we kind of see these kind of odd dynamics of power uh, existing in those where people have said that maybe African-Americans weren't often kind of free to say what they really thought or what they really experienced in these interviews because of the power dynamics that, that, um, that went on there. I mean, there's some anecdotes, for instance, that um, one w white P uh, WPA uh, worker who was interviewing an African-American was actually descended from uh his his interviewees uh slaveholder right so i mean there's these kind of dynamics of power that aren't weren't necessarily evident uh in the in the public works project that existed in california if you have native peoples interviewing other native peoples then native peoples kind of control the production uh, of knowledge and, and information uh for instance i remember reading like one person would always say uh, he would begin his interview process by saying uh this story is on my mind this morning so now i'm going to tell it Right. So I think you can kind of see that, that that person kind of shaped and controlled what kind of what was being said, who was he telling it to and the way in which the stories and his knowledge that he was sharing was going to be controlled. Um, and I, I mean, I, 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 as I, I kind of mentioned earlier, I, my first book, too, we were all like migrant workers here was kind of debt was built on kind of oral histories and oral traditions. So it's been kind of really kind of part of what I have done as a, as a, as a scholar and researcher. I mean, I, when I began doing graduate school, I, mean, I couldn't envision writing a history of where I'm from, from Round Valley, um, without interviewing people uh, for that for that project. Right? The title of the book, We Were All Like Migrant Workers Here, came from uh, an interview that I did with my aunt. Uh, that kind of allowed us to kind of, kind of allows Native people to, one, kind of talk about their own experiences, but also kind of shape the methodologies of, of, of how we kind of understand the past. So it, that oral histories are kind of interpretive is that Native peoples are interpreting the past. Right? We were all like migrant workers here, speaking to kind of a long scale kind of uh, communal kind of practice on the part of native peoples as, as migrant workers in Northern California, but also kind of information that you couldn't get, that I couldn't get in the archives. For instance, uh, often when I would go to the archives for all three of these projects that I've written, you know, I would have people describing what native peoples were doing, um, but I, we would never get it. I could never get what was it like to be a migrant farm worker from a native perspective. And I, like one of the great things that I always remember is like, um, I was interviewing a, a, a woman from Round Valley for about this project, and I asked her what it was like to be a, you know, to, to, to be a migrant farm worker. And one of the anecdotes that she told me was that um, when the, the workday was done, Native peoples would all get together in Mendocino County. They would uh, play grass game, kind of a gambling game with one another when the workday had concluded. And uh, her, da her dad was a very good grass game player. And what she would do is that she would lay on his back and she would fall asleep every night Kind of leaning on her on her dad's back as he would play grass game late late into the evening with other with other farm workers and I mean that's not something that I could get from the archive right that's not anything that uh, officials in the Bureau of Indian Affairs or or employers could ever tell me that would would be written in the archive that's information that I could only get from uh, from doing oral history interviews and I think that kind of perspective definitely kind of feeds into California through Native Eyes and definitely is in, in, in this recent book, We Are the Land, is kind of building on and kind of utilizing kind of oral history and oral tradition to kind of understand California from, a, from an indigenous perspective. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with William Bauer, professor of history at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he is the director of the American Indian and Indigenous Studies. We are in conversation about his latest book and, and a few other of his books, but his latest book is called We Are the Land, A History of Native California. It's interesting when we talk about American racial slavery that we had of, of, of African Americans, when we talk about migrant farm workers, as I was reading your book about Californian 
Indians and the history of Californian Indians, I thought about both, oh, California had slavery. And then when we talk about migrant farm workers, we think of today, many people, people from Latin America, many people indigenous themselves working in the fields today. Um, we also had that same dynamic in, throughout the, the 19th century, and maybe longer, you'll tell me, of, of indigenous people. And yet, I feel like these are stories most Californians don't know. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think in one hand, maybe why people don't know it is is twofold, right? Is I think one is just kind of given kind of sometimes how historical production goes is that sometimes people like to have a kind of a rosier uh, depiction of their past. And so I think two of the big kind of key moments in California history that are vital to the way in which kind of people understand the history of California is the creation of the Spanish missions predominantly in Southern California, but, you know, from say, you know, the, the Spanish missions were kind of these string of, of institutions from say San Diego to the, the little more North of the, the San Francisco Bay area, right? California. So the mission period is kind of really kind of instrumental in how people kind of understand California history. Uh, and then the second big event, right. is the California gold rush, right. That's the other kind of, if, if California, if Northern California has a creation story, it begins in Cal Northern California. It's created uh, with the California gold rush. Um, and I think because those are two kind of pivotal kind of creative moments for California, uh, I think people often don't want to see hear or kind of or kind of might elide or kind of avoid some of the more uh, kind of negative connotations or negative implications of those two events, especially for the the, the, the state's indigenous people. Uh, in, in one way, and and in, in one way, those are both really kind of related events. Both the Spanish period and then the later um, uh, United States period. Uh, attempted to separate indigenous peoples from each other uh, and separate indigenous peoples from the land. And so that's, these are kind of vital to the, the kind of the settler colonial processes that exist in California beginning in 1769 and carrying on into the, into the present day. Uh, and then both of those institute or both of those eras kind of relied instrumentally on kind of forced indigenous labor, meaning that during this kind of the Spanish period, uh, Spanish officials would kind of force indigenous peoples to come, move to missions where they kind of work principally kind of in either agricultural or pastoral or kind of you know, livestock raising uh, ec economies. And so kind of the Spanish in, in period kind of relied heavily on kind of forced indigenous workers or kind of unfree indigenous labor. Uh, during the American period, say beginning in the 1849 and carrying on into the 1860s and 70s, uh, the state of California had something called the Act for the Government and Protection of the Indians. Um, as many historians before me has, have said, the Act did a lot more governing than protecting of Indians. And, and part of that, that Act was a set of laws or set of procedures that allowed uh, white Americans to, as you noted, to indenture, often in unfree situations, right? Often kind of in situations that resembled slavery, uh, indigenous children. Uh, so principally kind of that it was it principally kind of er, er, early on kind of targeted indigenous children, but kind of kept indigenous children, both men and women, you know, boys and girls kind of in, in a system of kind of perpetual kind of lay unfree labor if, in a situation kind of definitely kind of resembling slavery throughout the throughout the state. And so it, this was occurring in Southern California. It's, it's occurring in, in Northern California. Uh, and it kind of vastly kind of, kind of shape, reshaped kind of California Indian lives, especially after the California gold rush. I mean, California Indian children were trafficked across the state uh, in that people would attack indigenous communities, capture children, and then sell them in places like Sacramento and into San Francisco, uh, and then also traffic indigenous children out of the state. So for instance, uh, when I was doing research actually for my, um, for my first book, I came across a letter of, a, of an indigenous woman um, she was writing to an agent uh, of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the early 20th century. And she's writing and she's living in Arizona. She writes about how as a child, she was stolen from her community and sold as a, as one of these indentured servants and then left the state and, and was by that time kind of living in Arizona. And she wanted to find a way to kind of maybe come back home and get back to, to her home community. Um, so you kind of see these kind of definite kind of practices up and down the state of California, this kind of this system of kind of of, of enslaved labor, unfree labor uh, that begins in the 1760s with the arrival of, Span of, of the Spanish and continuing for another century, well into the late 19th century. Do you think we should consider it slavery? Um, yeah, I think I think what that is is doing is asking us to think about um, a broader definition of slavery. 
I think when most people in the United States history think about this, uh, about slavery, they think about it in the context that you just raised it, right? It's typically located in the South. It's typically this kind of chattel slavery, uh, and it's typically kind of a white black kind of issue right, in terms of kind of race relations that it, that it's produced. Uh, but in, 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 when you move into the American West, you, it, it becomes a bit more different. It, it looks a little differently. It is more relying on other forms of co-opting and, uh, people for un- unfreely kind of taking their labor, right? So it's relying on kind of indentured contracts, that indentured servants, uh, debt peonage, uh, inde- indebting people, and then making them kind of work and, and not giving them opportunities to kind of leave or earn, earn wages and that sort of thing. Uh, these other kind of practices that looks that have these systems where kind of indigenous peoples are kind of trapped in this kind of perpetual system uh, of of unfree of of not being able to kind of uh, of of unfree labor, and this is something that would begin with the Spanish missions, um, continue through Mexican rule after Mexico gains its independence in 1821. Though, and I think this is important to the question I'm going to get to. At least Mexico allowed, if indigenous people, I guess, owned a certain amount of land or wealth, to be citizens of Mexico. That gets us to. The creation after the Mexican American War, the United States takes over, and the creation of the state of California. We're at the California State Constitutional Convention in Monterey uh, in 1849. They took up the issue of indigenous standing within the state, and they had an opportunity there to actually sort of change history. Um, and by a 21 to 20 vote denied indigenous people citizenship right of of the state of California. Can can you tell me more? I I don't think most Californians know this about the Constitution of the state. And and this is happening when in Washington, D.C., we're starting to see a very vigorous, robust debate over slavery there and citizenship issues there. Here, we, we had it in California about indigenous people here in this state. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting way, of, I think, of thinking about kind of United States history in general. Uh, and, and as you noted, right, during, uh, after the Mexican independence movement and the creation of the Mexican nation state, uh, some indigenous peoples became kind of citizens of, of, of Mexico. And that means that they, you know, had the same kind of citizen, c- citizenship rights of, of other peoples within Mexico. And it's be kind of, the notion is kind of equal before the law, right, that, that native indigenous peoples we're, we're just like any other kind of Mexican citizen. And th- this isn't for, for everyone, not, not everyone, but definitely say in this, in what it would be in California, definitely indigenous peoples that were living on and near missions during the Spanish period would be kind of ideally suited for this kind of citizenship. This is not the way in which the United States kind of thinks about its relationship with indigenous peoples, right? The United States beginning kind of in, in the 1820s and 1830s begins to, to kind of develop an argument that indigenous peoples are not citizens of the United States. They're actually wards of the government or wards of the United States and that the United States needs to kind of protect indigenous peoples. Uh, and we see a little bit of this kind of relationship manifesting even into the, even into the 21st century. And so when uh, California becomes part of, of, uh, of the United States, that you have this kind of, this kind of tense situation in which you have, uh, indigenous peoples that are not, are considered to be kind of citizens under under Mexico and under the tr- uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, Mexican citizens, including indigenous peoples, would have the same kind of would would be kind of have the same rights as as American citizens. Uh, but that's clearly not what happens in California, Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, those kind of that that other relationship, that other notion that indigenous peoples are kind of wards of the nation or wards of the United States and are in, intended to be kind of protected by the United States um, precedes or eclipses that idea about uh, ab- about citizenship. And so, as you noted, right, the, the California Constitution is very clear that it kind of takes away, uh, it denies Indigenous peoples the right to vote, whether or not they own private property, right, as, as one of the, the main conditions. Uh, the United States passes, uh, or the state of California, excuse me, passes that, that law that I just discussed, the law, for the, uh, the Act for the Gov- Government and Protection of the Indians, which outlines, so in addition to kind of stipulating that, that indigenous children could enter into, enter, quote unquote, enter into kind of indenture contracts, their indigenous peoples had certain crimes. Uh, there were vagrancy clause for indigenous peoples that didn't apply to everyone else. Uh, indigenous peoples, um, 
couldn't uh, set fire to the prairie or set fire to grasslands. That was a kind of a typically important way in which innate indigenous peoples managed and uh, managed the landscapes, the ecosystems uh, before the arrival of Europeans and then continued on to those practices. So there's all of these kind of, you know, these ways in which kind of indig indigenous peoples uh, lack the same kind of what we would now call right civil rights, voting, uh, vagrancy clause, kind of the, these kind of things that uh, that affect in indigenous peoples. Uh, and then even uh, one of the later kind of laws that comes into California is an act to kind of prevent the sale of firearms and, and, and weapons to, to indigenous peoples in California, right? So there's, there's this kind of early on, right after statehood, uh, we do kind of see what the, with this kind of erosion of a notion of what we would call kind of civil rights and citizenship rights to indigenous peoples within the state of, uh, within the state of California. The big problem I think that happens for indigenous peoples in California is that the federal government fails to step in adequately as it should, right? If so, if the federal government, so if the United States depicts or understands indigenous peoples as being kind of wards of the government, the way in which that kind of relationship was often created was through the treaty relationship in that the United States uh, would sign treaties with indigenous peoples and based it, and as the language of the constitution reads, is that treaties are the law of the land. Well, the United States sends out commissioners. They negotiate 18 treaties with, with indigenous peoples in California, but the United States fails, United States Senate fails to ratify those documents. And once there's no kind of treaty, treaty relationship, the federal government essentially kind of surrenders California Indian people to the state with, with kind of disastrous consequences. Benjamin Madley, who, who wrote the book, An American Genocide, Make, makes an argument, I mean, we can make an argument that genocide has occurred for indigenous people all over the, the continent, but he said California stands out specifically, especially when you look at the definition of genocide that came from the United Nations in the middle of the 20th, 20th century. Do, do, do you think there's something that distinguishes what happened to California indigenous people compared to to the rest of the country in the history there? Yeah, that's a good, yeah, I think we're having some really kind of fruitful discussions about the scope of, of genocide, not only in California, but also throughout the, throughout the United States. And I think it's been a, a kind of a fervent kind of interesting discussion to kind of to, to pay attention to. I mean, I, I think it's quite clear that the state of California uh, and the United States engaged in activities intended to exterminate indigenous peoples. Uh, you know, they, uh, that is quite clear in the, the, statements made by California governors, for instance, uh, by United States Army officials, by the leaders of state militias, by uh, the anecdotal evidence of uh, members, uh, employees of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, by newspapers, et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's, there's more than enough people calling for what we, for the extermination of indigenous peoples, right? Um, and I think that it's important to, to have this discussion because uh, I think it matter, it makes us better kind of accountable to kind of thinking about what happened in the past, but also how that past uh, shapes the experiences of indigenous peoples in the present. And so some of these processes, some of these activities, this, these kind of relationships are kind of persisting in, in, in the 20th and 21st centuries for, for indigenous peoples in Cal California, right? There, there's kind of, it helps to kind of shape and kind of think about these, these experiences. So it, that this, this history that we're talking about isn't only kind of located in the past, but it's kind of an ongoing conversation. Right? I mean, the, the, the governor of California kind of issued kind of an apology for, you know, for, for what happened in the past. And he, he labeled it in, a, in his you know, um, interview a little later, right? he called it, it's a, it's a genocide. Uh, and I think that it's important to, to kind of, to, again, kind of think about what happened in the past uh, and then think about how that kind of past affects and shapes us uh, in, in the present day. Uh, but I think one of the things that, uh, that I do think we need to kind of focus on is, is, is thinking through about how kind of indigenous peoples kind of shape these experiences too, right? So yes, it, there are kind of this litany of massacres throughout the state of California, but also we see kind of California Indian people kind of actively resisting these kind of military expeditions. I think one of the uh, kind of a clear example that we discuss in the book is the ability, is the um, actions on the part of the Hoopa in Northern California to kind of resist uh, United States and, and settler militias uh, and remain in their homeland, right? People wanted to remove them from their homeland in the Hoopa Valley and move them to another reservation. And then they resisted that, that effort and they, they've remained in their homeland. How since, did they resist it? 
uh, militarily resist, uh, kind of formed um, their own kind of military alliances and and battled the United States, uh, battled the army and, and settler militias, uh, and then just would refuse to when uh, when people wanted them to. There was an incident during the American Civil War where an agent says, we're going to take you to Round Valley. You're going to look at the situation there and then maybe we'll move you there. And Hoopal leader said, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> we're, we're staying right here in our homeland. Uh, and then effectively kind of used and their leaders effectively negotiated with state officials, state and federal officials to kind of remain in their homelands. And I, and I think it's it's important that we remember and understand those activities uh, as well. Um, and then indigenous peoples kind of use ceremony and religious practices to, to do the same thing, right? In the 18, early 18, in the late 1860s and in, into the early 1870s, there's a, a religion called the ghost dance movement. I think most people think about the ghost dance, they think about the later one, the 1880s, 1890 ghost dance movement uh, that I think most famously is kind of one of the kind of the sparks for the Wounded Knee Massacre on, uh, in, in South Dakota. But 20 years before that, a version of the ghost dance spread from, from Northern Nevada into California and into Southern Oregon. Uh, and it's basically kind of spreading very kind of popularly uh, in these areas that were kind of made over and attacked by these kind of genocidal campaigns by the settler militias and by the United States. And so, right, I mean, it's indigenous kind of religions kind of seek away in California to kind of recover from those losses of, of those genocide uh, of genocide. And so not only is there kind of a political military response to these expeditions to kind of maintain kind of what we understand to be kind of sovereignty today, but also kind of a religious and cultural acti uh, actions on the part of indigenous peoples to kind of make sense and to shape and adapt to the world that, that had, uh, that was, that was occurring in the 1860s and 1870s. The, the idea behind the ghost dance is that it would bring back their world. Yeah. So the, the, the 1870 ghost dance was a, was a call to, it would restore, uh, the people who had gone away, uh, it would restore animals that had been destroyed, often through the the, the, Calif the activities of the California Gold Rush, right? It was a uh, and it was a way too for California Indians to kind of uh, kind of deal economically, right? So it was a way for them, in some instances, to kind of make sense of, or kind of adapt to kind of new economic opportunities. And so it was, uh, you know, much like kind of the later Ghost Dance movement that was both kind of backward and forward looking. The 1870 movement was kind of was backward looking to seeing revive and re and restore a world that was kind of overrun by genocide and, and mining economies, but also kind of looking forward to kind of sustain and support indigenous communities going forward. I want to go back to the, the, the gold rush because this was devastating for Californian Indians. Um, how, how did they respond to it? And did I mean, I mean, some tried to get in on the wealth that was being mind but were basically prohibited from from doing so is that correct yeah I mean, early on unsurprisingly right california indians were were kind of a, a workforce uh, sometimes that they w might work for uh mexican citizens later kind of american right so so the california gold rush kind of actually be, kind of begins right at the end of the mexican period and then right after kind of the the, the american takeover uh and so people uh, American uh, former Mexican citizens and then uh, uh, then Americans might hire kind of gangs of, of California Indians to kind of go and pan for gold and mine for gold, uh, especially kind of early on. Other California Indian people might kind of be get figured out, kind of understood, right, that there was kind of an economic boom that, that you find these minerals and you can kind of get uh, pay, compensated for it. Uh, and so they might mine on their on their own. Uh, but as you noted, right, very off, very quickly, kind of white American miners began to kind of push California Indians uh, out of the mining area. Often they would uh, mining industry. Often they they relied on kind of violence, uh, right, to to kind of force California Indians out of the uh, out of the mining industry, attacking native communities, uh, that sort of thing to kind of to force them out. Uh, I do remember there was kind of an anecdote of, uh, for instance, is is this kind of California Indian youth in Northern California? Uh, went to one of these, he thought it was kind of an abandoned uh, mining tap, mining camp, uh, and then found uh, sacks of gold, uh, and then took them from the house. Uh, and then the miners came back, recognized what had happened, they tracked him down, they, they captured him, and then they brought uh, his entire community out, uh, the, the, the young man's uh, entire community out, and they hanged him right in front of, uh, of the native of, of, of his community. And the purpose 
right? I, we would we would say for that kind of practice is to kind of in store kind of a, a system of kind of violent retribution for any kind of crime that California Indians committed, right? Theft is not necessarily a capital offense, right? It's not something that would that would typically be punishable by death. But for a kind of a California Indian person during the California gold rush, those kind of things become kind of the part of or ca- kind of capital offenses. And so what we see is this kind of violent way in which uh, white Americans kind of establish law and order and power over indigenous communities, force them out of the mining mining kind of economy in general. Uh, but there's also kind of other ways in which the kind of the mining industry and the gold rush kind of undermine California Indian lives. It's, uh, you know, excessive silt from the mining industry kind of gets into the streams and rivers of Northern California, uh, preventing kind of salmon runs and killing sam- killing off kind of salmon populations, which were an important food source for California Indians. Um, if you've ever been up to like Northern California, you know, the Sierra Nevada areas outside of Northern, you know, I re- the one I'm thinking of right now is outside of Oroville, California, right? And hydraulic mining, they're essentially kind of stripping aside, stripping away the kind of the, the mountainsides of Northern California. Uh, undermining kind of indigenous ecosystems, uh, preventing them from kind of harvesting acorns and, and hunting for, for uh, and, and hunting uh, and fishing, as, as we noted earlier, right? So the California Indian, uh, the, the California gold rush kind of undermines California Indian economies, not only preventing them from participating in these new economic activities, but also kind of under, undermining and destroying older economic systems. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons, I think, one, that California Indians kind of became migrant farm workers, right? It becomes a way for them to kind of make a living when when their kind of ecosystems are being kind of undermined by mining economies and then other kind of agricultural economies a little bit later. But also kind of it speaks to kind of the importance of the other thing that I mentioned a couple minutes ago, the, the ghost dance, right? The, the ghost dance was, was an a- effort to kind of restore those oh, old ecological systems uh, and ecological relationships with plants, animals, uh, and, and other human beings. And so, uh, right, the go- the, we see this kind of I think unique and innovative way that that California Indians kind of adapted to kind of a, these kind of catastrophic events in the ni- in the 19th century. You mentioned earlier that in 2019, California Governor Gavin Newsom officially apologized, um, and in an interview later called what happened a, a genocide. But that wasn't actually in the official documents. Is there is there significance to that? Well, I, I think it's what, we, what I've been kind of, or I, what I may, maybe mentioned a little earlier. I, I think it's, a, it's one of these moments where kind of Americans and, and I, I think even kind of other people cross, you know, kind of a typical thing, right? Is that we want to kind of have a, a rosy kind of picture uh, of the past, right? This kind of notion of what we'd say kind of American exceptionalism, right? That that the United States is this kind of city, city on a hill to which kind of people kind of aspire. Um, and I think using terminology like kind of genocide, uh, obviously, right, uh, conflicts with that understanding of, of the United States' past. Um, but I think that, uh, and, and that's what I, I, I think that's one of the kind of the benefits of kind of interrogating genocide in California, interrogating genocide across kind of North America, as, as other scholars are kind of doing. I think it's important for kind of having kind of an, an accountability of what, you know, what is the kind of what is the history of the United States? What are the kind of the ongoing implications of settler colonialism in, in California and the United States? And, and I think also fundamentally is, is how that, how kind of these kind of, this history of adaptation and kind of colonialism affects indigenous communities in the present day. One of the kind of, the, this is becoming very kind of well-known, I think, hopefully, right? In, especially in terms of Canada and the discovery of, you know, unmarked children graves at, former residential schools, uh, you know, in most of them kind of that I've seen have been in like in the British Columbia area, um, raising kind of awareness of these kind of these, these practices uh, that are not only right. It's not only that, that it's not only going to happen in Canada, right. There's the, the accounting of what has happened in, in the United States in terms of kind of the off-reservation boarding school system, for instance, I, th- I think speaks to kind of this way of, of thinking a bit more critically about what happened uh, in in the past and and how it kind of shapes and affects indigenous communities in the present. So what we're seeing in in Canada with the burning of of the churches as as people are learning about what happened to indigenous children, then that's not so far removed from where we are. No, I don't think so. Right? I mean, I've, as we've seen, uh, is that people have gone on top toppled uh, monuments to uh, Confederate generals. Right in the in the south, uh, there's been efforts to kind of remove and 
and, and thinking critically about, say, monuments to Junipero Serra here in the state of California. Uh, you know, I, I think there are, yeah, I, I think there's often these, I think these moments are kind of really kind of important for thinking about, you know, kind of public memory, uh, monuments and commemorations of, of past events and how these other, how these kind of other things have kind of shaped and, and affected indigenous communities again, like in the present, in, in the present moment. Yeah. The, the city Fremont here, here in the, in the Bay area is just seen as, you know, a, a Southern Bay area city, but named after John C. Fremont, who, I mean, his, his record when it comes to California Indians is, is really terrible, which is also interesting and gets us into this strange dynamic of when you compare things of this time to the Civil War. He was a, a Union general Civil War hero who was freeing enslaved people in, in the South even before Abraham Lincoln was. Uh, but on the other hand, he, he, he was a a prominent Indian killer in California. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think you you definitely see some kind of interesting relationships between kind of California and that kind of that Civil War history. Uh, several kind of United States generals who fought on in, in the United States Army in, in the uh, in the Civil War, and then later fought uh, Plains Indians, Indigenous peoples in the Great Plains after the Civil War, got some of their first um, station posts or their first station in California. Right in the 1840s and the 1850s, uh, and, and so there is this kind of there is this kind of interesting relationship between kind of these genocides, these massacres of indigenous peoples in the 1850s and the 1860s, and then I think what happens in the Civil War, and then definitely kind of I think what happens uh, on on the Great Plains is that some of these people kind of learn some of these tactics or kind of apply these tactics or have this kind of interesting I think experience in California. And then kind of, and then you kind of see how their careers develop. I think a little bit, you know, with the Civil War and, and you know, on, on the plains. Um, I, I think more actually kind of needs to be done. I think to kind of tease out those, I think those interesting connections between kind of California, the Civil War, and then the later the the uh, what happens on the Great Plains in the eighteen sixties and eighteen seventies. Yeah, I, I think so too. William Bauer has been our guest. William Bauer is a professor of history at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where he is the director of American Indian and Indigenous Studies. He has joined us for a conversation about his new book that he is the co-author of called We Are the Land, A History of Native California. Previously, he also wrote California Through Native Eyes, Reclaiming History, another book that I was spending time with these these past few weeks, which is about um, the New Deal uh, program to to capture uh, California indigenous uh, stories. William Bauer, I've enjoyed our conversation very much. Uh, I, I feel like we've only scratched the surface. There's a whole lot more to talk about, a whole lot more I even suggested we could talk about, but we didn't get to. I, I hope you'll come back again, but, but I'm certainly appreciative of you taking this time today. Oh, I'd love to come back and continue this conversation. I've had a really good time, and so thanks again for asking me to do this. <laughs> 